How we doing? We doing all right? Yeah, I don't, not too many. Yeah, must have had a rough week. Huh? I, y'all, nobody wants to admit to anything this morning. I. <laughs> all right, take your Bibles. Turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to look at the church of Sardis today. The church at Sardis. Now, what we're going to see today as we look at this, in fact, let me get my clicker here. That picture up there is a picture of the church of Sardis. It's the ruins that are left. Okay, so if you were to go visit, um, that was a picture of it. And right now, if I'm... Let me look at my notes here. There's only a small village called Sart. That all that remains of this one this important city of Sardis. Now Sardis was an, imper, uh, an important commercial city, and it was located about 30 miles southeast of Thyatira. All right, we've looked at Thyatira. It was about 30 miles southeast of Thyatira, and it went. It had a road that went through a route that ran east and west through the kingdom of Lydia. Some of its important industries included jewelry, dye, textiles, which made the city very wealthy okay so from a, a commercial standpoint it was a very well-off city from a religious standpoint it was the center of pagan worship and the site of a temple of artemis which ruins still remain you can go see the ruins of the temple artemis um, and it the temple itself was right there next to the church okay now when we think of this and we look at uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, and we're going to look at it here and read a little bit about it in a minute. We're going to see three things as we look at this. We're going to see a problem that was facing the church. We're going to see a solution and a promise. Okay? So let's look. Now that we know a little bit about Sardis, let's look here. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1, we're going to read down through verse 6. It says, To the angel of the church in Sardis write the following. This is the solemn pronouncement of the one who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds, that you, have rep that you have a reputation, that you are alive, but in reality, you are dead. Wake up then and strengthen what remains that was about to die, because I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Therefore, remember what you received and heard, and obey it, and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will never know at what hour I will come against you. But you have a few individuals in Sardis who have not stained their clothes, and they will walk with me dressed in white because they are worthy. The one who conquers will be dressed like them in white clothing, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will declare his name before my Father and before his angels. The one who has an ear had better hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And all God's people said? All right, now, as we look at this, as we look at this, here we go. Yes. As we look at this, as I said, you're going, to see, you're going to see three things. You're going to see a problem, a solution, and a promise. Okay? Now, in verse 1, I want to touch on one thing here uh, as we go through this. And that is when he says here, it says, This is the solemn pronouncement of the one who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Okay? Now, I can tell right now everybody's imagination is running wild. Because it says seven spirits and seven stars. And you're wondering, what in the world does that mean? What I can say is that's a good question. Because none of the commentators I read, none of, the, none of the people that I could look up, really had anything to say other than to say that in the beginning when we read about Jesus, it talked about the spirit, all right? And it talked about the seven stars. And they all related it to that he is the one who gives life, okay? And that he is the one who has the spirit of God that gives life to all mankind. And that's about as far as they would, anyone would commit to go. So that's as far as I'm going to commit to go right now on that. Just to say that it's a description of, of Jesus, and it talks about his life-giving ability, not just physically but spiritually, and we're going to see that as we go through the text. Okay? So if there's any questions later, write them down. I'll see to it that Pastor Joe gets that, and he can handle that when he gets back. That's always a nice thing when you get to hand it off, you know. So we're going to hand it off to him. All right, so he goes on. He's going to talk in here about the problem. Okay, it says, I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. 
All right? But in reality, you are dead. There's the problem. We're going to stop right there. There's the problem. He says, what he was saying is that they looked good on the outside. All right? They even had a reputation within the city of being, being a church that did a lot of good works, did a lot of things for a lot of people to help them out. They looked good. They played the role well. But God says, I've looked at your heart and you're, you're dead or you're dying. Okay? So before we, and before, we, before we sit there and get too hard on them and say, yeah, you know, that's a bad church, we better be careful because we all do the same thing. Okay? We all act in the same way. Let's be honest. We all try to give off a certain facade, try to give off a certain look that we want people to think of us, okay? And so when we talk about them having a disingenuous Christianity, we need to be careful because we fall into the same trap, all right? You have certain ways you want me to see you, and I have certain ways that I want you to see me, okay? And sometimes that's genuine, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes the world is falling around, falling down around us, and we don't want to admit it, and so we come to church and we smile. I've said this before. One, one of the things I always like is I always like to say, how's everybody doing today? You know, and everybody smiles, and they nod, and they say, yes, everything's great. I know it's not. Somebody's lying, all right? Even among a, a, a handful of people this size, I know there's problems, okay? So I know everything's not well, so we have to be careful. We have to be careful, and that's what they had fallen into, whether it was because of the wealth of the city and the people they hung around with, Okay, and that it drew them away. Did y'all y'all read? Y'all know about Hillsong, right? Everybody knows Hillsong, all the all the praise and worship stuff. Uh, the pastor who started that got fired from his church this week. Ah, yeah, yeah, for the same reason. For the same reason, he got caught up in things that he shouldn't have got caught up in, and he was putting on a facade, and it finally came out. All right, that's why I say we got to be careful got to be careful that we don't fall into the same thing here. So the problem, he says, you have a reputation, a name. You know, and a name was big that back then because when you went to and, and lived in a city, they wrote your name down in a book. And that meant that you had all the benefits that came from being a citizen of that city. Okay? And because you had that, then you got a reputation. You got a reputation. They got to know you. Now, if you did something... Uh, wrong if you we'll go out to the extreme if you killed somebody then they would take and they would erase your name out of the book you had a bad reputation you don't belong to this city anymore or if you were in the city and you were visiting you didn't have the benefits and the rights of those that belong there so when he says you had a reputation it means more than just uh, that they had a name that somebody knew them all right and we have we we like that right if I were to go around, listen, I remember when, when, I, when I first went to my first church in Tarpon Springs. I remember we were going to call, uh, we had to call some deacons. I right? had some deacons step down and we were going to call some deacons and uh, talk to them and see what they were like. I remember one of the things I did is uh, I went through the city of Tarpon Springs and I, I talked to some of the people about some of the guys that were up. I wanted to know their reputation. What kind of reputation did they have outside the church, not just inside the church? What were they like outside the church? What did the people think? Were they fair? Did they deal with people well? Did they love people? Or did they come across, you know, somebody who was a snob? Did they do bad dealings? What did they do, you know? And uh, that's always fun. Go find somebody and ask them. Do you know Jason Lowe? What do you think about him, you know? Yeah, you know. What would they say? That's what he means. When he talks about a reputation, it's more than just, they belonged to the city. It was also their character. It was also their character. He says there, I know your deeds, your works, that you have a reputation, that you are alive, but in reality you're dead. Now what I want you to see here is that he's not talking to non-believers. He's talking to the church. He's talking to believers there. And he's saying to the church, to the believers in the church, I know your deeds. I know what you've been doing. I know what you're like. I know what the people think you're like but I know your heart, okay? So again, let's don't look at this and think, well, he's talking about people that aren't associated with the church because that's not true. He's talking about people who are there with the church. And he's talking about the end of my PowerPoint. He's talking about people who have a reputation, a bad reputation. 
he says there in verse 2, he says, Wake up then and strengthen what remains that was about to die. There we go. Let's see if we can go back to Cain. All right, we're going to go back. We're going to stop right there. All right. He says, I have not found your deeds to be complete. All right. In verse 2. He says, wake up then and strengthen what remains that was about to die because I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Now, when he says not complete, all right, he means that it, they fall short. He means that they're not complete because their heart wasn't right in what they were doing. So he says, because you had a reputation, just because you had a reputation, you think everything is good. When I look at your heart and as to why you did these things, I want you to know that your deeds come up short. They're not complete. They're not fulfilled. All right, so he says, wake up. Wake up, be watchful, is what the word means. He says, be, wake up. And that equals the idea here of repent. Of repent. That's what he's telling them to do. Wake up, spiritually, wake up. You know, I'm giving you a message. You have a reputation, but you're not there. Something's wrong spiritually. You're dying. Wake up. You know? I mean, I, can you imagine? Can you imagine how how, how they said it? it? It it wasn't a thing where, where he just said, "Hey, wake up," you know. It was, "Hey, what are you doing? Don't you see what's going on? Don't you realize that I know what you're doing?" As God spoke to the church, "Don't you know that I know your heart? Don't you know that I know exactly why you did what you did? I know the attitude with which you've approached things. I know how you've treated people in the city, and your works come up short." You are not doing what you said you're supposed to do. So the people went to church and did many other things, but the faith, the love, and the spiritual life that should have filled all their works have been growing less and less. Now, for those of you here who like to study your Bibles a little bit more than just that, the tense of the verb there shows that it was something that started back there, and as the results went on, they grew less and less, dim and dimmer, until they were almost out. They were almost out. But that's what he's saying. One man said this, Some of these deeds may have appeared wonderful and very good in the, in, in the sight of God, but they were, they were the reverse. Throughout these letters, as in all Scripture, the works are regarded as an open, undeniable evidence. In the sight of God is forensic. God is the judge who judges the evidence, and on the basis of this evidence pronounces not only a verdict that is just, but one that is undeniably, incon incontrovertibly just. A verdict to which the whole universe must agree. Now think about this. You say, man, that, that can't happen to me. What did Jesus say in, in the Gospels? You remember? In Matthew, I can give you the verse. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 through 23. He said there would be those that would come to him and they say, Wouldn't, didn't we do great works in, 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 your, in your name? Didn't we do this in your name? And what did Jesus say? Depart from me, I never knew you. And to me, there's nothing more terrible more frightening than to be this close this close to knowing jesus christ as your savior and not know him to me that that's just a frightening thing to know that there could be people here today even who who in their hearts know that they're not saved but are unwilling to do anything and put on the facade of just what we see here all right and my encouragement is please don't do that any longer if that's you Come to Christ. Come to Christ. All right? Now, in most of the other churches, there was persecution that was going on. And persecution can be dangerous because people tend to, to turn away from God or become apostate. But here, what's going on here? We can call it heresy, if you will. Heresy of character, if nothing else. Okay? Is worse you know why it's worse? Because when you have heresy of character like this, it spreads to more than just one. When someone gets persecuted and they walk away, usually it's by themselves and others are, we're trying to get them to come back, but they, they refuse. But in something like this, it'd be so subtle that it can spread like, like dry rot. And, and, and it just rots everything in its path. Many are deceived. And worst of all is, is, is that it's from within, the whole dying from within. The membership may be large, its works may be great in number and in size, but the life is dying out or is already dead. See, that's the thing. Because we want to be careful 
not only about our own lives because we don't want it to spread to anyone else. I don't want my life to be a detriment to anyone here. I want it to be a benefit. I want it to be a positive. I want people to see me, and I want people to see you, and see Christ in us and draw them to Christ. All right? I want them to say there's something different about about that Al Deputo guy. All right? Don't know what it is. He's a strange kind of guy, but there's something different, and I can't explain it. And hopefully it's because I'm walking with Christ, you know? And that's what I want them to say about you. I want them to say, listen, I don't know what there is about that church, but there is something different about that church. And the way they act and how they respond to things, there's something different. They aren't, they aren't like everybody else. And that opens the door for us to be able to talk to them about the gospel. That's what is attractive about Christ, is we should be different. There should be a difference about us. We shouldn't blend in, nor should we put on the facade. You know, working with college students like I do, they can, they can find a fake pretty quick. All right, they're pretty good about doing it. It doesn't have to be college students. It can be any kids. kids. Kids can pick out a fake pretty quick. You know, and so you have to be careful. You have to be careful because if you're faking it, it will come out. All right, God will. God knows who you are, and he will bring it to light. Not to be mean, but because he wants to draw you to himself. All right, so let's look on at the solution. Here's the solution. He says, he says, remember then. He says, remember then. Therefore, remember what you received and heard and obey it and repent. All right, that's the first part of it. There's a warning that goes with the solution as well. So let's look at the warning here. We'll read it and then we'll talk about it. He says, therefore, remember what you received and heard and obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will never know at what hour I will come against you. All right. So when we look at this, the solution is to, first of all, to remember. All right? And the idea of remember, as I have it up there, says to continue all along, to recall constantly all that they had been taught. So it's to go back to the beginning, to when they were first saved, when they heard the preaching of the gospel, and to remember what is it that they heard. It's almost like going back to the basics of Christianity, if you will. What is it that they were taught? And how was it to apply to them? And they were to remember that. All right? I like to think of the idea of the remember is to conjure it up in your mind's eye all, so that it's almost so real that you relive it once again. You ever do that? Y'all don't do that? Do we have any mental health, health counselors here? Because I may need it. Because I do that. All right? I will imagine things in my mind and it will almost be like I'm there again reliving it. All right? And that's what that idea of to remember means. Okay, the second thing is what you received and heard. The word received represents the faith as a trust. And the tense of the verb calls attention to the abiding responsibility of the trust then received. All right, and the verb heard is pointing back to the moment when faith came by hearing. In other words, the moment they be, when they became Christians. So when we become Christians, we get saved. It's not just that we know that we're not going to hell any longer and that we have a right relationship with God. That is true. But along with it comes a trust. And that trust is that God gives to you and to me the gospel. And we are to take that gospel, and we're not only to spread it by word, but we're to live it out. And that's what he expects us to do. It is a trust. Okay? It is a trust. God has entrusted something to you. All right? And that's why, if you think of that, when you think of the warning, it's no wonder he gives the warning. Because I don't know about you, but when I was a, when I was a young when I was a younger person, not too long ago, but when I was younger, and my brother, I remember giving my brother something that I had, that had value to me. All right? And I gave it to him. And you know what he did? He went and sold it. He went and sold it. Now, I want you to know, I got mad. All right? Because it had value to me. I gave it to him, not so he can go out and make a buck, but I gave it to him because it meant something to me, and I wanted it to mean something to him. And I wanted him to hold on to it, and he didn't do it. All right? Same thing here. God gives us a trust, the gospel, and he expects us to do something with it. He expects us to live it out and to take it and to share it with others, to tell people the good news. And if we don't, okay, the warning. We'll get to that in a minute. The third thing is, is keep it, obey it. 
The word means to keep or to guard. It's a continue and watchful attitude. It means 24-7. We are to watch ourselves and watch the gospel, the, what God has entrusted us with, and to take that and to share that with others. And to make sure, 24-7, that we're doing the right thing. There's no days off, no time off. All right, it's supposed to be there. And we're supposed to be doing what God wants us to do. That's what it means to keep it, to guard it, to make sure that we're taking care of it. Now, we're not quite to the, to the warning yet. But the next step is to repent. Okay? And I want to talk about repentance. What is repentance? Okay? Most of us would think, most of us has this idea about repentance. We think that repentance is, it is a, a turning from going this way to going this way. And when we turn, we're supposed to feel bad about ourselves. We're supposed to feel guilty. All right? So that when we repent, it's because we've done something wrong, and therefore we beat ourselves up, we feel guilty, and therefore we carry that guilt around for a while until we feel like it's been enough, and then we say, okay, I, I guess I've repented enough. All right? Lord Byron once said, only the weak repent. All right? Now, another man, Shakespeare, who was a pretty good poet himself, said this. He says, I will repent right away, or I shall be out of heart shortly, and then I will have no strength to repent. So Lord Byron says, only the weak repent. Shakespeare says that it is, an, it is a matter of strength to repent. Who's right? Who's right? Huh? I hear voices. But let me tell you this. Before we, before we say who's right or wrong, let me say this. Our culture today aren't at either one of those they would be closer to lord byron to say only the weak repent but most in our culture today don't think that we need to repent all right most in our culture today most people think that oh well if i sin it's, it's all right because it's god's job to forgive me and he'll forgive me no matter what i do so therefore i don't really have to repent okay because god will take care of that it's, it's his job right I mean, that's how our culture thinks. Now, I tend to think, as Darren said, that Shakespeare is the one that comes closer to it, that it is a strength. And not only that, but I think that repentance, repentance is the key to living the Christian life. Okay? Now, you may say that that's an overstatement there, Pastor. And uh, it could be, but it's not. All right? I really believe that repentance, living a life of repentance, is the key to success, if you will, to living a happy and fulfilled Christian life. Now, let me explain why. I'm going to give you three things about repentance this morning, and uh, you can preach a whole sermon on this, but I'm just going to give you three things. We'll probably have to move a little quickly through them uh, to get done. But first of all, there's going to, you're going to see the need for repentance, the nature of repentance, and the nurture of repentance. I like that. I'm not usually one that can string them together like that. So write it down because you may never get three ends in a row again like this. The need, the nature, and the nurture. All right? The need is this. I, I have that up there. I have to live a life of continual repentance. Not only that, but I have to come to the place where, where I have to realize that I am a sinner and I deserve nothing good from God. Bottom line. All right? Bottom line. I am a sinner and I deserve nothing good from God. The first thing we do when something bad happens is what? When something bad happens, when something bad happens to other people, what do we do? What's the first thing we do? All right? We ask this. Why did that happen to them? Why did that happen to them? What we really are asking is, were these people who died? You remember, you remember the illustration that's given in the Gospels where the tower falls on the 18 people? And they, they said, what did these people, you know, what did they say? What did these people do wrong? Jesus asked, were they worse sinners than anyone else? Because, see, that's the first thing that we want to do is we want to compare ourselves to other people. You know? Gosh, why, what happened to them? And, and am I where they are or am I better than them? Well, it didn't happen to me, so I must be better. I must be better. All right? So what we do is, as we compare ourselves, when something happens to us, what do we say? When something happens to us, we say, did I do something wrong? Am I being punished? Have you ever heard that? Or maybe you've said that. Maybe you've thought that. Maybe you haven't been bold enough to say it, but you've thought it. All right? Why did this happen to me? You know? What did I do wrong? Is God punishing me? You know? And really, the underlying premise here when we think about that 
And, and let me just say, these are instinctive responses. When, when you respond like this, don't feel bad. I'm not trying to get you to feel bad for responding that way. These are instinctive responses. It is our nature to respond that way. Okay? But what you got to understand is what is at the root of that, and then we can change it, right? Amen. Thank you. All right. The underlying premise to what is wrong with bad, when bad things happen to good people is that what we feel, what we really believe is that God owes us a good life. Let's be honest. We don't like it when bad things happen come in our life, do we? Does anybody like it when bad things? If you do, we've, we've got a mental health counselor here. We'll, we'll get you some help. Nobody likes that because we don't believe that it should be part of our life. We believe that when something bad comes in, that God owes us a good life, and therefore, why is this happening? That's why we begin to ask those questions. If that wasn't our presupposition, we wouldn't ask those questions. That's why the first thing in our need is that we have to understand that we are sinners and we deserve nothing good in life. God doesn't owe us anything. And the real question ought to be is not why bad thing has come to me, it's why has so little bad things, why has so little suffering come to me? See? See, I don't know what was going on in, in the church at Sardis, but they're around a lot of wealthy people, and so we're gonna, we could speculate here, all right? I don't like to do that, but we can speculate just, just for the heck of it, just for fun, and think that maybe they got wrapped up in the culture. All right? That, hasn't ha that doesn't happen to us, right? They got wrapped up in the culture. The culture was moving through, and they got caught on the wave, and they went with it. It was healthy, wealthy, and everyone doing, doing great. And so they wanted, part of, they wanted to be part of that. And so they jumped on that bandwagon, and they felt like God owed them that. And so as they did that, then they began to adopt this presupposition and they, they just couldn't see that God would treat them this way. And he began slowly just to drift away. All right, but that's the first thing. You've got to come to that understanding. God doesn't owe us anything. Secondly, the nature of repentance. The nature of repentance, what do I have up there? The, the nature of repentance is the connection or the acceptance of two realities. Okay? The first one is, as we've already said, that I deserve God's wrath. We don't deserve a good life. All right? The second one is, is that God is committed to saving us, all right, from what we deserve. you gotta, you got to hold those two in tension. Number one, I don't deserve anything, okay? The other side is that God is there. He's committed to saving me from what I deserve. Now, we see that best, and I think I may have you turn there. Turn to Luke chapter 15. Turn to Luke chapter 15. We're going to look at the story of the prodigal. But I think we get a good picture of repentance here. Luke 15. Luke 15, beginning in verse 11. We're going to look, at, we're going to look primarily at verses 21 through 23. Because the prodigal son, you remember what happened. He left. He wanted his father's inheritance. He wanted to split and take off and enjoy himself. And so he did. The father gave him his inheritance. And he gets out there and he squanders it all. And he finds himself broke. And so he, he wakes up one day and he says, even the hired servants where my father have a better life than what I have right now, so I'm going to go home. So he comes home, and that's where we get to verse, verse, verse 20. It says, so he got up, went to his father, but while he was still a long way from home, his father saw him and his heart went out to him. And he ran and hugged his son and kissed him. And here's what his son says in verse 21. He says, then his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's number one. That's number one. What he just said there fit into this idea that I don't deserve a good life. I don't deserve anything. I've sinned against heaven and against you. I've sinned against God and against you, Father, and I don't deserve anything good. Now, look at verse 22. This is where the second reality comes in. But the Father said to his slaves... Hurry, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. All right? There's the second half of that, of the idea of repentance, what repentance really is. It is, yes, truly saying, I don't deserve anything good, but it is also recognizing that God is committed, all right, to saving me from what I don't, what I don't deserve or what I deserve. He is committed to giving me better than what I deserve. And that's why we have what we have. 
Okay? So that's what happens with the prodigal son. He comes back, and the father says, he says, he says, I'm not worthy, you know, to which he was right. But then the father says, put the ring, get him a robe, let's smoke some meat, and let's have a party. Right? Let's have a party. Because he's my son. He's my son. See, and we truly haven't repented until we understand that tension, until we accept that, that tension and put it together and keep them there. You know, it's not just groveling because we did something wrong or feeling guilty because we did something wrong. Sure, it is that, but it's also understanding that God has forgiven me and that I belong to Him. And that one day I'm going to spend eternity with Him regardless. See? So let's look at the nurture here, and then we'll try to apply it. Nurture, then, is we repent when, we, when something bad happens and when something good happens. All right, in Romans, it talks about the kindness of God. Romans chapter 2 talks about the kindness of God bringing us to repentance. So when we live a life of repentance, we repent when we do something wrong, obviously. That's the obvious one. But we should repent when good things happen, too. Now, that sounds contrary, doesn't it? Be honest. How do I repent when something good comes into my life? If our, if our vision of repentance is i got to feel guilty, then why, you know, that's not what God is saying. God is not saying feel guilty when something good comes into your life. What he is saying is understand that what that good thing, where that good thing came from, that it came from me, that it's not something that you deserve nor something that you earned, but it's something that I have given you. So you see, yes, I repent when I do something wrong. God, forgive me as a prodigal. I've sinned against you and against whoever, and I'm not worthy of anything. But God in his grace still lavishes his love upon me. When something good comes in, we say, God, I don't know how you could do that for such a sinner as I. That's how you repent when something good comes in your life. That is the key to moving forward in your Christian walk. Because until we understand that, we will never repent when good things happen. We expect good things to happen. And again, that goes back to that presupposition that God owes us a good life. And he doesn't. A good life is all of grace. God owes us nothing. Once we understand that, then we can repent for the good as well as for the bad. Then repentance takes on a new meaning, a new understanding, a new feeling. It's not just because of the things we do bad. It's because we understand that the things, the good things, come from Him. And we are grateful for what He's done. All right? So the way that we nurture that, okay, is by doing it. Now, let me ask you that. Let me ask you something. When you repent of something, okay, because here's how you can tell. I'm going to give you a little insight here, and we can ask our mental health counselor to help us, but I'm going to give you a little insight on how you can know if you've repented or not, whether it's something good or something bad. When you repent, does it help you to take criticism better? Or do you feel a little you withdraw from criticism? you not like it. When you repent, does it give you more confidence to go to God the next time? Or do you, again, does it chase you away? When you repent, if you were shy, does it make you a little less shy? See, how does it, how does it affect me? When I repent, when I understand what God has done for me, does it draw me closer to Him and to others around me? Does it make me more accepting of criticism when it comes? Or does it do the opposite? If it does the opposite, then we truly haven't repented. See, that's repentance. That's what God is wanting the the church at Sardis here to do. He wants them to repent. He wants them to realize that they have done wrong and they are not worthy of it, but at the same time, He is willing to give them life. Look look back at Revelation chapter 3. And He says there, He says, Therefore, remember what you have received and obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, He says, I will come like a thief and you will never know at what hour I will come against you. All right? He says, wake up. There's opportunity for them, if they repent, to know what real spiritual life is, to be connected to Him. But if they don't repent, then there's the warning. Okay? We're going to look at the warning here. Oh, the warning. God will come against or judge His church in order to bring them back. All right? Listen, we've got to understand that God is not going to let us, if we find ourselves in the same place as the Sardis church, 
he's not going to let us go. This reminds us, I don't know about you, but as I, when I read that, first I thought, man, I don't want God coming against me. All right? There might be a lot of people that I could put up with coming against me. God is not one of them. All right? The Bible says that it is, it is a bad thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. I don't want God angry at me and judging me because I'm unwilling to repent, first of all. The second thing when I read that is it reminds me of what he did with the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, doesn't it? Say, you humor, humor me and just nod your head so I know you. Thank you, yes. All right, humor me. It does. It does because he did. If you think about, and, and you say, give me proof. Okay, I heard that. You got it. I got this. How God has always treated his people in both the Old Testament and New Testament. You got examples there in Revelation of, what, of some churches we've already studied. But you also got Deuteronomy and Haggai. All right? Look here, just so you can see it. Here's the blessings and the cursings of Deuteronomy. All right? It says here in Deuteronomy chapter 28, it says, And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And all God's people say, Amen, we want that. Blessings, yes. But look at verse 15. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Now you think about the history of Israel and how many times they went into captivity because it was a result of God's judgment upon them because they wouldn't follow him. Let that sink in for a minute. They went into captivity. Another country came and took them captive. Let that sink in for a minute. I mean, this just wasn't this wasn't just a slap on the back of the hand. This, re, this resulted in bloodshed and people dying and God sending them into captivity to bring them back. The book of Haggai, that well-known book of Haggai. All right? Probably one of those pages that are still stuck together in your Bible. If you find it, it's by Haggai. Haggai is about them restoring or rebuilding the city. And in essence, what happens is God judges them because they won't rebuild the temple. They start and they stop, and they begin to rebuild their own homes and spend all their time there and not on the temple of God. Well, the temple of God was the symbol of God's presence with them. Now, God didn't want them not to have a place to live, but he wanted the temple rebuilt as well. And look at what he says here. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above, above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have, I have noticed right there, I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and on all their labors. He says, I have called for this. This is my doing, God says. Look around, blame it on what you want, global warming and all that kind of stuff. The environment changes and it's going on. God says, I did this because you're not being faithful to me, Israel. And if I've got to get your attention this way, this is what I'm going to do. Now, I believe that the church, whether it's the church in Sardis or the church of Crossroads, is one of the things that God depends on. He uses us in order to reach those around us, to reach our culture. And when we're not doing what we're supposed to do, then God is going to judge us if we're not careful. All right? You look around what's going on in our culture. We look around what's happening. Look, let's don't, let's don't, let's don't kid ourselves. What's happening in the world today, as a, in large part, is a result of the fact that the church is so impotent in, in our culture. Not just our church. I'm talking about the church at large. It's impotent in our culture. And because of that, God says, I'm going to bring you back. What's it going to take? What's it going to take? How, how, how sensitive is your heart? How soft is it? Are you willing to repent now, or do I, have to get, do I have to get tough? Do I have to come against you? And if I have to come against you, I will. I will. I can make things good. I can make things bad. This is my world, God says. I created it. I'm the sovereign ruler over it. If you think that anything happens in this world that God is not 
involved in, you're wrong. God's involved in it all. And if you think that we can just slide by and that God won't come against us, we're wrong. He'll come against us individually. He'll come against us corporately. And that's what he's doing here. He's letting them know. You either repent or I'm going to come against you. So the, the promise or the, the solution has a positive side and a negative side. All right? you, you either do it. If you do, there's life. All right? If you repent and do what you're supposed to do, there's life. There's all the benefits that come with it. If you don't, then I'm coming against you. And I will judge you. So start looking around. Let's look at what happens. Let's see where we are. Okay? Let's look at, let's look at the last part. The promise. Okay? The promise here is this. He says, Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white, in white garments, and I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So there's two results from this promise. Number one, the Christian will have a name or a reputation, a standing before God for all eternity. Think about that for a minute. Jesus says if we can live in this world unstained, unsold, that we can walk with him. That we can have a reputation of being a friend of Jesus. Think about that. Think about that. That should excite you. Our Savior says we can walk with him. All right? That we can walk with him. And not only that, but he says the second thing here is that Jesus will confess his name before his Father and the angels. He will, declare, he will declare our names before the Father and His angels. I don't know about you, but it's a mind blower. To me, this, to me, this is, it reminds me, and, and the analogy is not, not anywhere close to being perfect. So when I use this analogy, please, you know, oh man, that's a bad analogy. I already know it's not going to fit 100%. All right? But I think it's a good one anyway. And that is this. It, it reminds me of marriage. It reminds me... When, when it says walk with me, I think of when, when a man and a woman get to that place where they know that they belong together. And, and my way of thinking is when the man goes before the woman's parents and says, I want to marry your daughter. I want her to walk with me the rest of my life. That's a great time, isn't it? Look, we're not going to eat until somebody gives me a positive affirmation here when I ask for something, all right? No, it's a, it's a good time. Listen, it's a special time. It's a time you'll always remember. I remember when I proposed to my wife. I remember what her father said and what he didn't say. I remember how it went. I remember when we had, had the engagement party. It was a great time. But I also remember that when we got married at the end, when it's done, the bride and the groom turn around, and what does the pastor say? He says, it is my pleasure to introduce to you or to declare to you Mr. and Mrs. and you name the name. It's a great time. Now you think about that. Jesus is going to declare our names before the Father and all the angels. And he's going to say, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Al Depito, who walked with me for all his life and kept himself unstained, and he's here to spend eternity. Wow, man. I'm telling you, if that doesn't blow your mind, it I don't know what will. If that doesn't get you excited, then your exciter is broke. Okay? All right, let's, we're going to wrap it up here. See, I did that because that's the end. You see that? All right, application. Number one, God who sees the heart wants us to live genuine Christian lives. That's what he wanted out of the, the, the church at Sardis. He wanted them to live a life that was true Christianity. All right? He wanted their heart, and if he had their heart, then it would speak to the whole world. Okay? So that's the first thing. God wants our whole heart. Secondly, we as believers are to live a life of repentance. When we understand the tension that is there between the two realities, that yes, I am not deserving of anything, but yet God is committed to giving that to me because he loved me and he sent his son to die for me. When we understand that, then we can live a life of repentance and repent for what we've done wrong as well as for the good things that come in our life. And then the third thing, does the promise of walking with Jesus in righteousness 
and having him declare our names to the Father and the angels hold any appeal for you and for me. Because that really is the bottom line. This world is not the bottom line. We're all going to leave this world at one point. We're either going to die and go to heaven, or he's going to rapture us out at some point. But we're all going to leave this world in one way or another. And does the appeal to know that we can be with Jesus, walking with him and having him declare our name, does, does that hold anything for you? Is there any tug in your heart that says, man, I want that? I want that. Because that's the, bo- that's, that's the, end, that's the bottom line. Do I live for Jesus? Do I love Jesus? And do I want him more than anything else? Because if I do, then we get excited when we know that we can walk with him in righteousness. Amen? Amen. All right, we're going to sing a song. If I can get the praise team to come up. We're going to sing a song. I'm going to ask Pastor Jason to come up because I'm going to go play. And whatever God is leading you to do, if you've got work to be done, then, then deal with God. And uh, and stand and sing this song with.